Near this spot are deposited the remains of one who possessed beauty without vanity, strength without insolence, courage without ferocity, and all the virtues of man without his vices. This praise, which would be unmeaning flattery if inscribed over human ashes, is but just tribute to the memory of Boson, a dog born in Newfoundland, May 1803, and died at Newstead Abbey, November 18th, 1808. Lord Byron's tribute, perhaps the most eloquent of many to the gentle giants of Newfoundland, a breed that most certainly would have been extinct on its native shores were it not for the lifetime devotion and untiring efforts of Harold McPherson. It was Harold McPherson's struggle to preserve this enduring symbol of Newfoundland character and dignity which placed him among yesterday's heroes. Although Harold McPherson was best known for his work with Newfoundland dogs, he was among the first to support the theory that professional livestock breeding and farming could be carried on in eastern Newfoundland. He began with imported champion horses and cattle and experimental seed plantings at his famous Westerland farm. Almost this entire valley behind me was once the beautiful acreage of Westerland, now the center of the capital city of St. John's. The land was first cleared by the Thomas family in 1852. They built this striking old house, which has since been enlarged and altered by the McPhersons. During the administration of Sir Robert Bond, himself a gentleman farmer, the Thomas land was turned into an experimental farm and model agricultural station. Bond's successors considered the enterprise to be a waste of money, and so in 1912 it was put on public tender and sold to Harold McPherson for $7,500. By that time, the McPhersons had become a prominent family in the commercial, artistic, and social life of the community. An Aunt Margaret was an accomplished artist in Europe. Clooney was a distinguished physician and inventor of the gas mask used by the Allies in World War I, and his son Campbell, a recent Lieutenant Governor of Newfoundland. An early member of the family was a well-known skipper in the west coast trade of Scotland, Alexander McPherson, sailing out of Greenock, a lowland port for Glasgow. In 1804, his son Peter emigrated to St. John's as a clerk with a Scottish firm. He was sent to manage their store at Port de Grave and eventually took it over himself, establishing Peter McPherson and Company. By 1900, the McPhersons owned the leading Water Street retail business known as the Royal Stores and numerous other enterprises throughout the country. As a man of means, Harold McPherson could afford to indulge his love of farming and soon expanded Westerland from its original acreage, importing championship horses and cattle as breeding stock and experimenting with seeds and fertilizers suitable for Newfoundland's sparse soil. By the 1920s, Westerland had become a social and agricultural success, where Capital City Society gathered for fox hunts, cattle shows, and picnics on the spacious and immaculate grounds. With horse races on the frozen surface of nearby Kiribati Lake, it became a financial success also, as Harold McPherson demonstrated championship stock could be bred in Newfoundland and distributed throughout the world. Robert Petrie breeds Newfoundlands at Kennels in St. John's. Harold McPherson uh, first became interested in Newfoundlands in 1901. The government at the time wanted to present a suitable gift to the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall and a committee was formed to find a Newfoundland dog and cart. 
Harold uh, McPherson was on that committee at the age of 17. Harold was appalled that at the great lack of Newfoundland dogs available of quality and uh, he started breeding. Um, in 1910 he took a dog that actually passed through St. John's. It was a dog being sent to Sir Wilfred Grenfell by Earl Grey. The government had asked uh, Harold McPherson to look after the dog for the winter. He bred this dog with a number of his bitches and basically started the good purebred Westerland line. Gradually, Harold McPherson's passion for breeding championship horseflesh was replaced by his consuming desire to re-establish the Newfoundland dog on its native shores as the best bred of its kind in the world. But first he had to answer the question, was Newfoundland really the native shore of this magnificent canine? The earliest really, traces of well dogs preserved. were found on the island by Dr. Jim Tuck and his team of archaeologists from Memorial University near the settlement of port au in 1975. Radiocarbon dates from that grave are just about 4,000 calendar years old, so it's somewhere around 2,000 BC. The dogs probably weighed somewhere around 20 kilograms, say 45 pounds at the most. So I think unless there were some awful significant genetic changes between 4,000 years ago and today, or whenever Newfoundland dogs first appeared, it doesn't look as though we can demonstrate any relationship between the two breeds of dog. Given selective breeding, they certainly could have changed into these uh, larger dogs that we recognize as Newfoundland dogs. Whether there was any selective breeding or not, we simply don't know until we get some good skeletal evidence between 4,000 years and you know, a few hundred years ago. If Dr. Tuck could find no connection between the dogs and his discoveries and the Newfoundland, there were plenty of other theories as to how this aristocrat's ancestors came to these shores. In 1615, for example, Captain Richard Whitburn, returning to Exmouth, wrote of his experiences in the New World. The wolves and the beasts of Newfoundland, black and bear-like, came down near the seaside where the men were laboring with nets, owling and making a noise. My mastiff dog went with them into the woods and did not return until nine or ten days and without any hurt. It is possible that Sir Richard's pet bred with the local animals, since later visitors report seeing large beasts resembling bears but having kindly dispositions. Harold McPherson always believed that these chaps were descended from a dog called the Great Pyrenees, brought to Newfoundland on Basque whaling ships in the 1600s. In fact, Parks Canada archaeologists working off Saddle Island in Red Bay, Labrador in the summer of 1978 did discover the wreck of a 16th century Spanish vessel named the San Juan, confirming earlier evidence that the Basques had whaling stations in Newfoundland from 1500, and perhaps confirming Harold McPherson's theory about their dogs. But his friend, Kitty Drury, a leading authority on dog breeds, always disagreed. Kitty is a past president of the Newfoundland Club of America and lives at Saranac Lake, New York. I first met Harold McPherson in 1928 in Boston with my second Newfoundland, which was imported from England. My first Newfoundland, strangely enough, came from Newfoundland itself. And it was one of Harold's original breedings of a pointed nose, curly coated type of Newfoundland. Harold was judging at the time in Boston. Then I didn't see Harold for about 15 years. And my husband and I came up here to research the breed. And Harold was one of those that helped us in the writing of the book, because he had such tremendous knowledge of the breed. The name of the book is This is the Newfoundland. And it was published originally in 1954. And we visited Harold here at the house. And we saw the dogs that he had. And from then on, it was a friendship that developed very rapidly. And all Newfoundlanders, you know, love to argue and debate about things. And I'm the same way from New, from New England. And we used to debate about things in hot and heavy. But we ended up knowing that this was the greatest dog in the world and just loved each other. Pyrenees, I think, has no relation to the Newfoundland at all. The Pyrenees dog came from different dogs on the continent of Europe. And remember, they are a pure white dog. 
if they did go back to the Pyrenees, they would have to have double dew claws, which are little bones that come out on the rear legs. And they would also have a wheel to the tail, which is typical of the Pyrenees breed. They also have what we call a bear-like head, which is not at all like the Newfoundland head. So we feel that in the long run, we have proved that it does not go back to the Basque dogs or the great Pyrenean dogs, but it goes back to the English setter. My basic theory of the Newfoundland dog is that he comes down from the northern breeds that were big, heavy-set dogs. You find them, the um, uh, Norwegians had these big dogs. I feel that when the whole continent was one in the north, that these dogs came down or were brought over by the Norsemen and brought to this country, and then we know they left their animals here, and the chances are they inbred with the local Indian dogs. Whatever the origin, Newfoundland dogs reached the peak of their popularity in England in 1864, when the Prince of Wales entry, Cabot, won the London Dog Show. Much of this popularity stemmed from the paintings of Sir Edwin Landseer, who had a peculiar effect upon the breed. One theory is that when he started painting these big black dogs, he just couldn't get the dog, he said it was too black, he couldn't get the glossy coat. And so he decided that, well, let's make it a black and white dog. And from then on, people started breeding black and white Newfoundland. I don't believe this. I think that's a great story, but I don't think it has much truth to it. We do know that he painted a distinguished member of the Humane Society, Bob, a dog of Newfoundland. Most of these dogs were not really white and black. They were a, more of a white dog with maybe a black head and different kinds of markings. And there's one particular story that I've always loved about the Newfoundland. There's a picture of Bob, a uh, brave Newfoundland dog, and there's a little girl lying next to him with these polished shoes on. And she's absolutely exhausted lying back against this. And I had this hanging in my house one day, and this old gentleman came in and he looked at it and he looked at it and he said, no wonder that little girl is exhausted from pulling that great big dog ashore. <laughs> the result of that crossbreeding to match the famous portrait. This is a Newfoundland Landseer, a handsome animal, but some purists still refuse to accept it as a true member of the breed. Bob and Megan Nutbeam are the foremost breeders of Newfoundlands in the province today. Landseer, that's a created dog. Um, firstly, we, we dedicated ourselves to, to doing what we could to expand the existence of Newfoundlands, the original Newfoundlands in Newfoundland. Uh, and secondly, um, breeding Landseers, it doesn't interest us. Primarily, we wanted to we wanted to do keep something, the keep the original dog. Newfoundland in Newfoundland. This is Rito. He's still young, but I think uh, he needs to fill out the shade more. But uh, we think he's one of the best dogs we've bred. He is, he is the right height. He is the, exactly the right conformation. He has good bone. He's got good movement. He is a good representative of the breed. While Newfoundland dogs were capturing the hearts of breeders and society painters in 19th century England, they were not doing so well on their native soil. From 1815 to 1900, there were government proclamations encouraging farming and sheep raising and banning all dogs but sheep dogs. In fact, in St. John's, there was a five shillings bounty on all animals.
With the onset of the Great War in 1914 and its consequent food rationing, raising these great beasts became an unpatriotic excess in Great Britain. By the time Harold McPherson came to the rescue, there were few dogs of quality to be found in Newfoundland, and their once great popularity in England and on the continent had vanished to be replaced by the heroes of the newly popular Hollywood films, the German Shepherd, the St. Bernard, and the Collie. In 1927-28, Harold went to the Westminster dog shows in New York, and he had a rather interesting win, a fourth place. This was his first real start in the world of Newfoundlands and showing. Harold McPherson's first win for his dog, Westerland Flora, in the 1928 show of the prestigious Westminster Kennel Club of New York, in one stroke restored the Newfoundland to its previous popularity. I pointed out earlier that Mrs. Drury uh, had bred Newfoundland. She uh, and Major and Mrs. Godsell uh, were among the pioneers of... Important uh, breeders from all over the world besieged Harold and Flora for pictures and paw shakes. Very well and soon after his return, Westerland was flooded with their requests for puppies and information on the breed. And kennel owners began to announce with pride that my dog is a real Newfoundland. Harold McPherson spent the next 15 years traveling to shows and writing articles and giving speeches extolling the virtues of his favorite dog. But perhaps the most exciting moment came when his Westerland Seeger was featured on the 1931 14-cent Newfoundland stamp, and six years later on another, next to King George himself. Of course, Newfoundlands are best known for their courage in the water and their life-saving ability. Harold McPherson told the story of taking his first Newfoundland, an 80-year-old named Oscar, to see a train for the first time. The animal was terrified at the machine, and thinking that his master was in trouble and in danger, he charged it and, of course, was injured. Well, he did recover, but he was unable thereafter to distinguish between friendly and unwelcome guests, and so spent the rest of his life in restrained but honorable retirement at Westerland. There we are, pretty girl. There we are. There we are. <laughs> Sir Edwin Lancer's most famous painting, titled A Distinguished Member of the Humane Society, is of a handsome male named Bob, who had 23 rescues to his credit in 14 years along the London waterfront. And there are thousands of other heroic stories from every country. Now, we don't know whether it's true or not, but I have heard <laughs> that the Newfoundland coat also has more air sacs in it than an ordinary coat. Whether this is true or not, I don't know. But it is true that when you see a Newfoundland dog swimming, their whole back is usually along the top of the water. While your German Shepherd or your Terrier is going through the water, the Newfoundland's going on top of the water. Most dogs uh, paddle in a dog paddle. You've heard of the dog paddle. Newfoundland usually paces, and this keeps its top level with the top of the water. Powerful swimming dog. In 1914, the London Daily News Prize for the dog with the highest record for courage in England went to a Newfoundland. And the dogs gained fame for saving not only humans, but another famous rescue breed in Europe. In the early 1800s, the St. Bernards, of course, as you know, were at the hospice and were these great rescue dogs. They went out and they brought people in and they traditionally had the flask around their neck. But they were losing their stamina. They were inbreeding these dogs and they were getting rangy dogs, dogs that did not have the intelligence. 
So they said we had to bring something in. So they imported two Newfoundlander dogs, they called them. They bred these dogs to those St. Bernards. And it was from that day that you find, and still to this day, long-coated St. Bernards. And those long-coated St. Bernards we know go back to the Newfoundland cross that was made. And this has been authenticated. Newfoundland's confederation with Canada brought some controversy to Harold McPherson in Westerland. The new livestock registration rules demanded that purebred dogs be nose printed or tattooed. He insisted that nose printing was impossible because of the natural wetness of the nose, and that tattooing was cruel and unnecessary if the papers were properly filed. However, bureaucracy as usual won out, leaving the infuriated breeder to fume in a 1954 article in Time magazine that if this kept up, Canada would become a dog damn dominion. Basically, you pay, put ink on the nose and then you press it on paper. The difficulty with that is that in order to trace a dog with a nose print is that you have to compare like fingerprints and that is expensive and time consuming. The simpler method is tattooing the ear. Uh, in horses uh, at the time, the lip was tattooed. And I think this is where Harold felt that the dog would be maimed if the lip or the ear were tattooed. The regulation stuck, but Harold McPherson had made his point. His work encouraged younger men to begin breeding and showing the native dog. Among the first was Hugh Baird, who produced the grand champion Newton, consistent winner of best of breed citations. And there followed Don Mercer and Harold Duffett, and today the nutbeams of Harbor Grace and Bob and Jacqueline Petrie, whose dogs were featured in our program. But it was Harold McPherson who had the energy, means, and interest to rescue from virtual extinction this noble symbol of local character and dignity. This hero of today salutes him as one of yesterday's. I'm Harry Brown, I'll see you next week. The CBC gratefully acknowledges the cooperation of Parks Canada and the Provincial Historic Resources Division in the preparation of these programs.